Okay, hello. Uh, welcome everyone to come to the second day of the workshop of geometric methods for analyzing discrete shapes. Uh, today, um, our first talk will still be Christopher Bishop and uh, Professor Bishop will continue his amazing story given yesterday on the mappings and the meshes to connections between continuous and the discrete geometry. Let's welcome Professor Bishop. All right, thank you very much. So this is the plan I showed you yesterday, and this is what we had accomplished. Today, I wanted to tell you about um, three applications of, uh, of sort of analytical thinking, continuous thinking to problems of, of mesh generation. So the basic idea is that we have a polygon in the plane and we wanna cut it up into pieces, which are pretty nice. And for me, um, these are either gonna be quadrilaterals or triangles, uh, all of one or all of the other. I, I don't have any combined uh, meshes. And by nice, we mean the angles are nice. So I don't wanna use, for example, triangles that are long and skinny, okay? Or similarly, you know, quadrilaterals, which are have small angles in them. And the first two uh, things here, uh, quad meshing and um, triangulations, these are, uh, these basically are, are applications of conformal mappings. The third one, uh, which also involves uh, triangulations, but of planar straight line graphs instead of polygons, is a little more challenging. Um, it doesn't directly use conformal mappings, but it uses a different idea that sort of comes from the dy dynamical systems. And, and so it's still a continuous kind of a motivation for that. And I hope it fits in. Each of these topics could easily fill an hour, even multiple hours. And so my goal today is only to state the theorem and then to say, what is the continuous idea which goes into the proof and sort of convince you that it's the right idea, that, that this idea should lead to a solution of it. And if I can accomplish that, um, then that, 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 that's my goal. And you can always invite me to come back and, and talk or, or, or chat about the details of how, how to expand any of these topics into an hour or, or multiple hours, okay? So, um, in case you don't know it, a, a planar straight line graph is a finite union of points and edges. It's basically anything you can draw, you know, with points or edges. It, it, I mean, I, you know, it could just be a point set. That's a PSLG, that's fine. A polygon, that's a PSLG where the edges happen to meet um, uh, edge to edge and so forth. Uh, the faces are the, are the complementary components of the PSLG. And we're particularly interested when these faces are uh, a Jordan curves, and this forms a mesh. I mean, you can also have uh, slits, but that would not account for a mesh in my picture, or you could have faces that were not simply connected, and that wouldn't count either. So I'm interested in, in meshes where, where all the uh, bounded faces are, are Jordan domains, and really, I'm interested in when they're triangles or quadrilaterals. And so a triangulation is a, is a PSLG, it's a mesh where all the faces are triangles. Now, on the right, I've drawn something which is not a triangulation. All the faces are triangles, sure enough, but some of them are actually quadrilaterals because if you like count the number of vertices on this triangle, you'll see that there's four of them. So that's actually a quadrilateral, but in my mind, disguising as a, as a triangle. And so this is called a triangular dissection. So this is a mesh where all the uh, faces have a triangular shape, but don't necessarily just a meet uh, uh, three edges of the PSLG. So another way of saying it is that in a triangulation, when you have two triangles meeting, they either meet at a vertex or they meet along an entire edge. And that's not the case here. For example, this triangle meets two triangles on partial edges, not on full edges. Uh, in general, uh, triangular dissections are less restrictive. They should be a lot easier to construct. A triangulation is a simplex. It it's, requires a lot more uh, work to do it. At least that was always my belief. Um, in recent weeks, I've begun to doubt this, that maybe triangulations and dissections are really about the same difficulty to construct. Um, I'm gonna explain that further later in the talk, but it's something that's bothering me uh, quite a bit. Similarly, you can have a quadrilateral mesh where all the faces are quadrilaterals. And you know, in, in a dissection, you could have things that look like quadrilaterals, but in fact, you know, have more than four vertices. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to start today by talking about quadrilaterals because quadrilateral meshing is easier than triangulation. Reason is very, very simple. If you, um, 
have a triangle, say one edge is, is fixed is like zero one. Once you fix the other angles, you have your triangle. So it's basically a two dimensional family. But in a quadrilateral, when you fix an edge, you can fix these angles. You also have to fix a length here and a third angle. And then that will determine um, the quadrilateral. So it's four parameters. So the space of quadrilateral shapes is basically four times or twice as big in dimension as triangles. And so if you're trying to build a shape out of quadrilaterals, you have a lot more pieces to choose. And so it should be a lot easier to fill in a shape using quadrilaterals than using triangulation. In fact, this is true. Uh, we have much better, sharper, easier to prove theorems with quadrilaterals than we do with triangulations. And so uh, we're gonna do that case first. So optimal quad meshing. This was basically the last slide of my, my previous talk. So it says that uh, given any uh, polygon, there is a, uh, a quad mesh where the upper angles are all less than 120 and the new angles are all bigger than 60 degrees. And you can do this in O of N work where N is the number of vertices. Original angles remain unchanged because if you have a polygon that has a very small angle in it, it can't go away. So whatever quadrilateral mesh you create, that angle still has to be there. But in this theorem, that angle is not made any smaller. It's, it stays, but you don't subdivide it. And every other angle, except for those small ones that you start with, they're between 60 and 120. And the basic idea is to uh, conformally map the disk to your polygon, mesh your, your disk. The disk is a standard domain. We know lots of ways of meshing it and transfer those over. Okay, And because conformal mappings preserve angles infinitesimally, well, we hope that if we have a, a sort of a macroscopic object, the angles don't change too much. Okay, And this all works. This, th th this plan can be made uh, completely to work. There's a couple of flies in the ointment. Uh, the first thing is that if you just do this naively, um, you don't get the O of N bound. So the problem is that if you were to apply um, this picture to, to a polygon that looked like this had a very long, narrow channel. Maybe this thing only has about 10 vertices, but this is like 10 to the 10 here. That previous picture where you sort of divide up the disc, it would sort of create a picture that looked like this. And what you would create is a mesh of the polygon that had something like 10 to the 10 pieces in it, not 10 pieces because this long narrow channel uh, would, uh, would create problems. And so what you have to do is you have to find all those channels quickly. And then the channel itself is not really a problem because we could just mesh this with one giant rectangle like this. And this has nice 90 degree angles in it in this picture, even though it's long and skinny. So in order to get the O of N work, I don't care about long and skinny. I'm gonna allow that but I want the angles still to be uh, close to 90 degrees. Now, the idea for finding these long narrow channels comes from hyperbolic geometry. There's something called a thick thin decomposition of a manifold or a surface. If you have a surface, a, a typical Riemann surface looks like this, and we're interested in closed geodesics, which are quite short. Now, typically a closed geodesic on a surface is you know, reasonably long, but there could be puncture points, cusps in the surface where there are very short loops. Or there could be handles, but there's also very short loops. And these are called the thin parts. And every uh, Riemann surface, every hyperbolic manifold, in fact, always has a finite number of these thin parts where you can have very short loops. And somehow the rest of the domain, the thick part of it, which is in white here, it's a well-behaved object. Um, in fact, there's a, a theorem called Mumford's compactness theorem that says that basically you never have to worry about the thick parts the thin parts are the only issues uh, that, that, that ever cause you problems. And so these are analogous to the long narrow channels in a polygon. And so we define the thick and thin parts of a polygon. Uh, I won't give it precisely, but the rough idea is we're looking, a, 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 a thin part corresponds to two sides of the polygon. So the distance apart is much smaller than their individual sizes, their individual diameters. So this edge and this edge are about unit distance and they're about unit distance apart. So that's not very thin, that's, that's fine. If you have two edges that join together, then their distance apart is zero. And so that's definitely a thin part. And I've shown these thin parts, there's a thin part for every corner. But you can also have edges 
which are relatively long, but the distance between them is very short. That's the interesting part. Those are the narrow channels in the, in the, um, in the thing, in the polygon. And that's the thing we would like to first identify. And if we want this O of N time estimate, what we're going to do is um, find these channels, cut them out of the polygon, and then apply the conformal mapping to the thick parts. And that's the, that's the overall plan. Now, here are just some more examples of thin parts. Here we have two edges, which are long, but close together. Here we have an edge, and here we have an edge, which are both long, but fairly close together. Um, here's an edge with a little jag, and here's an edge. They're both long, but they're quite close together. And these are different kinds of thick parts, but they can always be cut up into quadrilaterals in pretty easy ways. And so this is, um, this is the story that you locate these thick parts and they are not challenging to, to quad mesh usually. They're pretty easy. And then we're gonna use conformal mappings on what's left over. The hard part is finding the thick parts. But this is uh, where we use conformal geometry. If you have a polygon, and it has one of these long, narrow, thin parts, there's a bunch of vertices over here and a bunch of vertices over here and no vertices here in the thin part. And the hyperbolic distance from here to here is very, very long. It's very hard to go through that channel. And when you conformally map to the disk or to the half plane, this is the picture up in the disk, some of these things cluster together here and some of them cluster over here. And this channel becomes a great big thick annulus. In fact, if this is a, an R by one channel, the radius of this annulus is e to the R. It is exponentially larger. And so when you do the conformal mapping of the polygon back to the disk, the vertices occur here and they're obviously clustered. <laughs> and there's big, big gaps where the thin parts are. And so it's quite easy to write a linear time clustering algorithm, which will locate these clusters and tell you which annuli you have here. And then you map them back and you're handed back a list of all the thin parts in only linear time. And so this is, uh, this is how the conformal mapping idea comes to play in this. Um, so the idea then is to decompose the polygon into these thick and thin parts, to mesh the thin parts by hand, and the conformally map meshes on the disk to the thick parts. Um, I already showed you that when you had sort of these um, um, hyperbolic thick parts, they were easy to mesh. When you're in the corners, eh, it's a little more intricate, but I, in my paper, I, I explicitly show how you can mesh these things. The point is that the, along the edge of the thin part, you can basically arrange things so that your vertices are evenly spaced. And now the thick part is out here. And so when you're doing your, Whatever you're going to do out here, you just have to make sure that you end up with your mesh elements being equally spaced. And so the, the thin part and the thick part can be glued together. So you have to connect them. Uh, again, that is pretty straightforward. Um, the thick part, we do handle by conformal mappings. And so this is where the idea of transferring from the disk to the polygon works perfectly. So once you've gotten rid of the long, narrow things, which eat up too many squares, in the thick parts, the number of squares you need in this picture is O of N, where N is the number of vertices in the other picture. Now, in the thick parts, everything works out beautifully. Um, now, these things are not quite quadrilateral, as you notice, because there's five vertices. They're actually pentagons. We have to fix that. Uh, we fix that by moving to a more natural to a geometry in the disk, which is the hyperbolic geometry. Here's a classic tessellation. You could probably use any number of them, but I'm using a pent pentagonal tessellation. And the picture is we have a polygon, we've thrown away some thin parts, and what's left, the white section, is the thick part. And that, what's, that's what gets mapped to the disk. The thin parts are isolated to these regions because these cutting off curves are basically lines or circles. They go to things which are almost circular arcs in the uh, domain. And now we superimpose our pentagonal tessellation on this picture. And we basically, um, we're, we're taking the convex hull of the thin parts and we're covering it by our tessellation. And then there's a boundary region. And here we just sort of extend these curves in here. And so a little nicer, it looks like this. And now we have a finite number of mesh elements and uh, they, they fill in the thick part. Now these are not quite quadrilaterals, you notice. They're still pentagons. 
Um, in fact, there's four different shapes in this picture. Here are the four different shapes that occur. And we have to actually quad mesh each of these in a way that they line up. But that's very explicit. Uh, here's a quad meshing of each of the four different kinds of shapes. And these are designed so that the spacing is basically equally spaced in the hyperbolic metric so that when you put these pieces together, the meshes actually add up. Now, all these things are basically 90 degree rectangles, except at the center here, there's degree 72. 72 is between 60 and 120. And so even if you take a conformal image of this and you change the shape slightly, it, the 72 still stays between 60 and 120. The more dangerous thing is what happens at the center of the triangle. If you blow that up, you see that there's actually a 120 degree angle there. Um, so when you conformally map this, that might get perturbed to like 121 if you're not careful. But what you do is you take a piece of this mesh and you transport it to your polygon by a linear map. A linear map doesn't change the angles at all, so you're okay. And then you use the conformal map here, but out here, everything is almost 90 degrees. And then you use a partition of unity to glue together your conformal and linear maps, and you've maintained your 60, 120 bounds exactly. And so that's the, the rough idea. And that was the end of part one. That was the, uh, the quad meshing section and the, uh, the rough idea of how you use conformal maps to it. Conformal maps come in two ways. They come in defining the thin parts in O of n time, and then they come in by transferring a standard mesh of the disk to the polygon. Any questions before I go on to part two? Uh, no question. I should do a sound check to make sure at least you can hear me. Go ahead, what was the question? Uh, no more question. No question in the okay. chat box for now. Um, no questions because it's completely clear or because it's completely like unfollowable. Okay, it's completely I guess I'll find clear out later. To me. All right. A question if I could. Uh, I have a question. So, go ahead, please. So, so you have this uh, order in algorithm. Yes. How does the how does the prefactor in the algorithm depend on the range of angles? So you had said you want to be as close to 90 as possible. You've chosen this window of 60 to 120. Right. I'm, I'm assuming so, the content depends on that difference. Yeah. So how did that constant depend on So the 120 difference? comes up because of the triangles here. So at, you, you, at the center of the triangles, you actually have three things coming together. You have a degree three vertex in the mesh. So you have to use a 120 angle. And this actually follows from Euler's formula. I didn't mention this, but the 120 bound is known to be absolutely sharp because uh -huh. if, you, yeah. if, if you had something that was better than 120, you can actually show the what. So you can actually show that the hexagon, the regular hexagon, cannot be meshed without a degree three vertex. That follows from Euler's formula. And okay. once you know you have to have a degree three, you know you have to have a 120. Mm -hmm. If you're dividing, if you have something a bit bigger than 120, like 121, you have to subdivide it. And the best you could do is subdividing it is cut into two pieces of 60.5. So for angles that are a little bit bigger than 120, if you want 120 to be your upper bound, you have to allow 60 because you have to subdivide anything that's bigger. Mm -hmm. And so 60 could be the minimal lower bound and mm -hmm. it is actually doable. So you can actually get between the, the sharp upper bound and the sharp lower bound. Okay, so this is something which we cannot do for triangulations because I said triangulations are harder, mm -hmm. but for quad meshes, you okay. can get, there, there, there's an obvious upper bound from Euler's formula. There's an obvious lower bound from dividing by two and Remarkably, the most obvious bounds can be attained. Um, this is uh, kind of shocking to me. Less shocking as time goes on, I guess, but at the time it was, uh, it was quite surprising. Is that enough? Uh, yeah, I don't want to hold you up. You've got a tight time frame. <laughs> okay. Well, there's no sense holding up you know, something which makes no sense. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's silly. So now I want to go to triangulations. Now, one obvious thing about quadrilaterals is that you can draw diagonals in them and make them triangles. And so an automatic corollary is that we always have 120 degree triangulation. So there's always a triangulation where the upper bound is 120. In fact, much better things are known. It's actually known that every polygon has a 90 degree triangulation. And so I, I call this a knot for a non-obtuse triangulation. So I use this term a lot. And so having an abbreviation for it is a little handy. Okay. Now there's a long history of this. Um, 
Uh, probably the, the the most important thing to mention is that this was uh, proven uh, back in uh, 1960 uh, by Barago and Zagalar. Um, they had published, unfortunately, in a Russian and in a topology journal. This is part of a Nash and Bedding theorem for polyhedra. And apparently this escaped uh, notice of, uh, of computer scientists in the West because there's a whole string of papers about this subject, which were already uh, uh, basically contained in this work from 20 or 30, 20 years earlier. Uh, eventually around uh, 2004, I think someone noticed uh, that uh, there was this connection. So now people are aware of it. Um, but the question that you can always do this triangulation with 90 degree bound uh, in computer science, of course, the, the, the timing estimates are important. And so for point sets, uh, it was discovered you could do this in linear time and then people improved it to polygons both quadratic time and eventually linear time for polygons. So every polygon can be cut up into uh, basically right triangles with a linear number of pieces and always having upper bound 90 degrees. In fact, you can always take uh, all the pieces to be right triangles if you so desire, that's possible. Now, can we do better? Could we get a lower bound like we had for quadrilaterals? Or could we improve the 90 degree bound to like 88 degrees? Uh, the answer depends on this complexity issue, how many pieces you want. If you're one of these people who insists on algorithms being like polynomial time, then the answer is no, you can't do better. If you have a rectangle, which is like a one by R rectangle, it only has four vertices. So if you want to use order of four, say to the nth power, you know, you want to use a fixed number of vertices, then if you're, if you're only using m of these, you're going to have at least one triangle whose size is r over m. And as m is fixed and r is going to infinity, this triangle is going to look narrower and narrower and narrower. It's going to have a small angle in it. So you cannot get a lower bound on the angle of a triangulation of a polygon unless um, you allow arbitrarily many. So if you allow a lot of triangles, then you could cut it up like this, and then you can get an angle bound. But if you want the complexity, there's no lower angle bound. Similarly, if you want complexity bounds, you can't do better than 90. Because if this angle was 89, and this angle was 89, then this angle is two, okay? So if you have something bounded below 90 for your angles, the third angle has to be bounded away from zero. And we just said you can't have a bound away from zero if you're having a complexity bound. So the, the, the 90 degree bound is sharp when you consider all possible polygons, because by taking very, very long narrow rectangles, you can't do any better. But suppose we don't care about complexity. Eh, we don't just cut it up, you know, just you know, use as many triangles as you want. Then how, much, how well can you do? Well, then you can do better uh, depending on what the polygon is. Um, if I hand you a polygon, which has a very small angle in it, then I have to use an angle close to 90, because if I have an angle theta, and I think of taking an isosceles triangle, each of the other two angles here are 90 over theta over two. And if I don't take an isosceles triangle, one of them is bigger than 90 minus theta over two. So if theta is like 0.00001, the other side of that triangle has to be like point, you know, 89.9999. I, I can't get a bound. So I have to allow bounds. So my upper bound depends on my lower bound. But suppose I, I take that into account. And in fact, that's the only restriction, this example. The theorem is um, that suppose you have a triangle where the minimal interior angle is theta. Then there exists a triangulation where the upper bound is 90 minus the minimum of theta and 36. So in particular, if the smallest angle is less than 36, there's a triangulation with exactly the sharp angle bound. I mean, this is just a bound that comes from considering a, a single triangle, but it applies to all triangulations. For larger angles, it's not quite that simple, but you always uh, get 36. So 36 over two is 18, and 18, 20, 90 minus 18 is 72. So um, for, for other polygons, uh, something happens at 36, uh, that, that changes it. Um, 
the square, for example, you can show all of its angles are 90 degrees, obviously, but it has a 72 degree triangulation and that's sharp. You can't do better than 72. Again, this is- yeah, sorry, order. Professor Bishop, do you have a yeah. typo here? Do you need Probably. to divide the minimum by two? Yes, yeah. that is a typo, thank you. Um, so the square has minimal angle 90, but you know the um, but but the bound is, is still 72. And this is Euler's formula, basically, because using Euler's formula, you can show there has to be a degree five vertex somewhere in the mesh. And once there's a degree five vertex, there has to be an angle at least 72. Okay. But you can get away with that. I'm going to talk about this a lot more in the next 15 minutes or so. So we're going to get into this uh, quite a bit. All right. But the idea of the proof is to use conformal mappings, is to take, uh, we're going to conformally map our giving polygon to some other polygon that has an equilateral triangulation as its mesh. That's, these, these bounds are 60 degrees. That's about as nice as you can get. We're then going to transfer that mesh back to P. And then since we're starting with something that has the optimal angles for any polygon, hopefully we'll get something that's optimal for that particular polygon. That's the, that's the philosophy anyway. So which triangles have equilateral triangulations? Well, if you want to, to triangulate by actual um, equilateral triangles, they all have to be the same size and they have to stack together in a very standard way. So the things that have actual equilateral triangulations are just sub polygons of the triangular grid. That's it. But all these things have angles which are multiples of 60, 60, 120, so forth. You could take a more general polygon, which is not actually on the grid, but has only those angles, only has those multiples. It does not necessarily have a uh, equilateral triangulation, but it has a, a 60 plus epsilon triangulation for any epsilon. So you can, so these things are pretty close to being uh, equilaterally triangulated. You can check and see um, easily that, that this is going to be the case. Um, just to give you a quick example, if you take a tri equilateral triangle, put a smaller one on it, you can slide this thing back and forth. And all these things, when you slide it back and forth, the angles are always still multiples of 60. But sub polygons of an equilateral grid, there's only a countable number of those. And there's an uncountable number of these sliding polygons. So some of them cannot be equilaterally triangulated for sure. And, uh, but, but being able to do it almost equilaterally, 60 plus epsilon, that's gonna be good enough for us. Okay, so here's a, just a general picture. Here is a polygon P prime. Its angles are all multiples of 60 and it has a lovely equilateral triangulation. And we map it conformally to something where the angles are not multiples of 60. But uh, the equilateral triangulation goes over to something that's very nice. Because conformal maps preserve angles, when you're near the middle of the polygon, the triangles are almost preserved. It's only when you're near the angles that there's some distortion. In fact, there's a very explicit estimate that the amount of angle distortion of a triangle is, is, is comparable to its diameter divided by the distance. And so this triangle is about five diameters away from the boundary. And so the distortion here is roughly like one over five. When you're right at the boundary, then there could be quite a bit of distortion because you can have a 60 degree angle mapping to something like maybe is 90 degrees. And so there's quite a bit of distortion, but it's only at the angles. And if you take a very fine grid, you can basically treat the other vertices as being very far away. And near this vertex, the picture looks like this, that an equilateral triangulation, in this case, I drew it 180 degrees, will map to something which is distorted near the vertex. But once you're far from the vertex, these all look like equilateral triangles again. So the problem localizes to what happens at the vertices. And this makes it, uh, makes it easier, okay? So what we wanna do is we're given the polygon P, it has some angle theta. And what we wanna do is choose a P prime, which is either 60 or 20 or 180 or 240. And so that when we map these angles, the distortion isn't too bad. And what you need is, if this is your theta angle over here, and this is psi over here, it's equal to K times 60. We want the distortion of theta over K, we want it to end up between 36 and 72, because those are our, our the, the bounds in the theorem. And if we do some arithmetic, 
What it means is that the number of angles here we need, the K, is going to be uh, between theta over 36 and theta over 72. So there's, we can make a little chart. If P has an angle between 0 and 72, then P prime, we have to choose a 60 degree angle. When theta is in this range, we have to choose 120. For bigger angles, we get some choice. For example, between 108 and 144, either a 120 angle over here, like two of these 60 degrees, or an 80, three of them, that would work out fine as far as the distortion estimates. And so now I can show you how this works in a case. Suppose we have an octagon. This octagon has angles of 135. 135 is here, it's between 108 and 44. So I want to build a P prime, all of whose angles are either 120 or 180. Now, in order to form a polygon, the interior angles have to add up to be n minus two times 180. So when you have a closed polygon, those things add up. So if I were to choose every vertex to be 120, I wouldn't get the right answer. I wouldn't, it wouldn't add up to be correct. If I chose everything to be 180, I get n times 180, which is too big. So I can't choose them all. Instead, what I do is I take six angles of 120 and two of 180, and then they add up to the right answer. And this is the picture you get. Here's your octagon. It has um, four, uh, it has six vertices um, where you have a, a 120 degree angle, and then it has two of them where you have the 180, and it maps uh, to this. And if you make this grid finer and finer, you get a picture that looks like this. Um, and the worst angle is um, at this point, you have, um, see this angle, you have three things here dividing into three things here. So you can figure out the angle is here. And then you also uh, uh, have uh, these angles. We have two things and they divide up into two things here. It turns out when you, when you do all the calculations, the worst angle you get is, uh, is 65. That's the biggest angle that occurs in the middle the angles are all very close to 60 because they're equilateral triangles. But in this particular picture, in the limit, as you make the mesh finer and finer, you show you can get 67.5. Now, is that the best you could do? Turns out the answer is yes. This is the optimal um, uh, triangulation in terms of angle bounds for an octagon. How do I know that? Can I prove that? Well, I'll show you the basic idea of how that goes into it, but I will not give the details uh, for proving this is optimal. Let me just do one other example, which is a square. Um, the square has 90 degree angles. And according to the chart, 90 is between 72 and 180. So I have to choose, I have to choose P prime to have four angles of 120. One, uh, two, three, uh, uh, problem. Um, yeah, four times 120 is 480. It's not 360, which is what the angle is supposed to do. And I don't have any choice. I'm not allowed to use the other angles because then the, 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 the bounds will be violated. I have to choose 120. I don't have a choice. Uh, so it's impossible. This, this, the plan breaks down. It doesn't work. I, I'm crashing. So this, this thing doesn't work. Um, well, what do I do? I'll show you what we do. We do something fancier. So to state the actual theorem, it's a little bit technical. I'm, I'm sorry uh, for this, but I'll, I'll try, to, try to state it for you. So let's suppose we have a polygon P, a set of vertices, theta denotes the interior angles, and given an angle bound theta, uh, phi rather, uh, which is somewhere between 60 and 90, we're going to define the angles, the interval of angles 180 minus phi to phi. And so this has the property that if you have any phi triangulation, an upper bound of phi, all the angles have to be in this interval. So this is just comes from considering isosceles triangles. And we're gonna label, given a triangulation, we just label the vertices with how many triangles make contact at that point. Now, if each of our angles individually are in this interval, if we have two of them, then the actual angle here has to be two times that bound. Or if there are three of these angles, it has to be three times the bound. So in order, a, a necessary condition for a, a triangulation to occur is that the interior angles be in the, the, the count at that vertex times this, this interval of admissible angles. And this is just pretty clear. Um, 
what we're going to do now is just consider a, an abstract labeling, just label the vertices of the polygon uh, and call it admissible if this condition holds. And now we don't know that there's a triangulation that goes with it. We're just pretending that there's a triangulation that has that number of vertices, number of triangles at each vertices. And what it turns out is that if there's admissible labeling, so if there's a triangulation, there's a labeling, that's obvious. The converse is also holds, and that's what's not obvious, that if you have a labeling, then there has to be a triangulation. That's what I'd like to say a, a few words about. So it's convenient to talk about the curvature of a triangulation, where the curvature of a boundary vertex is three minus the number of vertices. So we have three triangles coming in, that is curvature zero, discrete curvature zero. For interior vertices, we consider six. So where six triangles come together, that's um, curvature zero. Where seven come together, that's curvature minus one. Where five come together, that's curvature plus one. And then the Euler's formula for faces and edges uh, looks a lot like gauss bonnet that the sum of the interior curvatures is equal to six minus uh, the sum of the boundary curvatures. So six is kind of the topological term here. And we call this the curvature of our labeling. So if I'm just given a labeling, I don't have a triangulation. I don't know what this means. But if I'm giving a labeling, I can define this because I'm just summing up the values on the, on the uh, curvature. And in order to get the angle sum correct, in order for P to exist, it turns out if you want a, a 60 degree polygon that has exactly these labels, and you sum up the interior angles, it's equal to 120 times the number of vertices minus two. That's the correct answer, plus this curvature term. So this had better be equal to zero if the polygon is going to exist. In this case, it does. In the case of the square, it doesn't equal to zero. And so you can't write down P prime. In the case when K is not equal to zero, we take the labeling which minimizes the curvature. We take the flattest possible labeling. So. When you consider all the admissible labelings, you can, you can compute all their curvatures. And this turns out to be an interval. This interval could just contain positive curvatures, in which case we let kappa, the, kappa be the one that's closest to zero here. Or it might contain only negative numbers, in which case we let kappa be the, the one that's closest to zero. Or this interval might contain zero, which is the great case. That's the case which we know how to handle already. That's curvature zero. And the theorem, says that if you know these curvatures, you know everything. If you're given any polygon whatsoever, it has a phi triangulation if and only if, well, in the range between 72 and 90, you just need there to be some admissible labeling. There just has to be some labeling which, um, which has a, a bounded curvature, positive, negative, whatever. However, when you get closer to being equilateral, when you get closer, uh, you're below 72, but above five sevens, which is around uh, 64 degrees, then you need the curvature to be non-positive. And if you want to be very close to 60, between 60 and 64, then you actually need that boundary curvature to be zero. And these numbers 72 and 5 sevenths, they come in because of degree five and degree seven vertices. At a degree five vertex, you're forced to have an angle of 72. And at a degree, uh, seven vertex, opposite it, there has to be a 450 over seven angle, which is the same as five sevenths. And so what happens, in fact, in this picture, um, I should have said it here, is that in this case, the top case, everything is degree six, except in the top case, you may have some degree five vertices. In the second case, you may have degree seven. But in the third case, the entire triangulation is all degree six. It's completely uh, flat, zero curvature all the way through. And so this is something which I only proven in the last couple of weeks. Um, to me, it's shocking uh, that you can compute the optimal triangulation bounds for every single polygon. And there are some corollaries which, which to me are just sort of nerve wracking. Uh, one thing is that the upper bound only depends on what the angles are, not the order and not the edge lengths. So if you draw two polygons with the same angles, but they look completely different, they still have the same upper bound. The theorem implies that the upper bound is actually attained, except in that case of 60. I showed you that sometimes you could have a 60 degree polygon where you did not have an equilateral triangulation, but that's the only counterexample. That's the only case that doesn't happen. And finally, 
This theorem says that if you have a triangulation with upper bound, that happens if and only if you have a dissection. Now, triangulations are dissection, so that case is obvious. But what it says is if you have a polygon and you cut it up into triangles in a way which is not a, a simplex, but simply a dissection, if you can do that with a certain upper angle bound, then you can improve it to a triangulation automatically. Same bound. I would never have thought this was true a few months ago. I would assume that you have so much more freedom in choosing dissections, you can obviously get a better angle bound for dissections, but you can't, it's the same. And this is just, sometimes you discover things which change your whole feeling about how the universe works. And uh, this is one of those occasions. It's really, uh, so now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm spending my time looking for theorems about dissections and seeing if I could prove the same result about the stronger triangulations. Uh, I don't have many examples, but so far it's always worked. Um, and so this is like disconcerting to me. So the way that this works is back in 1984, Gerver had proved that if you have a dissection of a polygon, then these conditions hold. And they follow very easily from Euler's formula. And it had been conjectured that you go backwards. If you have these conditions, it implies a dissection exists. And this theorem implies that's true, except instead of getting a dissection, you actually get a triangulation as well. And this is, um, to me, this is just kind of scary, like, the, like, like some kind of trick nature is playing on us. Uh, I'm not quite sure I believe it, but I've been through this several times. So I don't see the mistake in the proof, but it, it just seems too good to be true. Let me just finish off this section with a, a couple of slides. What happens when you don't have kappa equal to zero? Remember, we had the case of the square and uh, the cap is here. We have to take two angles in each case. The cap is here are um, one, 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 which is three minus two in each case. And so the degree was six minus four is two, which is not zero, obviously. So the square does not have a zero curvature boundary. What do we do here? We do a trick. We take our original polygon, this is an edge of it, um, and we cut a slit into the polygon. And then we take that slit and we open it up. And so the P prime we generate actually we'll have this little wedge in it. And we triangulate this, and then we map back conformally. And when we do, we have to make sure that these triangulations match up so that these points over here, they actually form a triangulation. If we were not careful, what we could get is a picture that has triangles over here, and the triangles over here don't match up across the slit. But it turns out we can solve that problem. We can do the conformal mapping in such a way that the, the triangles match up exactly. Now, what happens is that this line is not straight. It turns out it has to be a curve in order for that to happen. But in the pit, in, 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 in this, 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 this curve is actually only about one degree off of being a straight line. So in the picture, this is an actual computer picture. It's not hand-drawn. This is actually drawn with conformal mapping software. It looks darn straight. Um, and that's because the angles that are in it are on the order of 89, um, and they're very, very close to 180. They're like 179.5, they're very close, but they are slightly curved, okay? What this does, the secret to this, is that this degree seven vertex, this has some uh, negative curvature in it. Sorry, this is degree five, sorry, that's degree five, it's a pentagon. So this has a negative, this is a plus one curvature on the interior curvatures. Over here, if you add up the curvature going around this corner and this corner and this corner, the curvatures are one and um, a minus two and uh, one. Sorry, got that wrong. Sorry, it's two minus two and one. So this has positive one curvature on the boundary. Here, the boundary curvature is zero. The slit trick transfers curvature between the interior of one polygon and the boundary of the other. So when the curvature of the boundary is not zero, cutting the slit transfers some of the curvature from the boundary to the interior. And this way, by doing this several times, we can make the curvature of the boundary zero as we need for the P prime to exist. If the curvature is negative, you have to play a fancier trick. Again, you cut a slit in the polygon, but now you have seven degrees here. How do you get a seven degree polygon in a grid? Well, what you have to do is have a corner which goes around more than once. So the thing you map to is not a planar domain, it's actually a Riemann surface where one of the boundary vertices has degree seven in the grid, not degree six. So there's actually some wrapping around. But when you open this up, 
when you expand, whoops, I didn't want to open it up that way. When you open this up, this has the process of taking some negative curvature on the interior and it transfers into negative curvature on the boundary. So um, I will just hand wave my, my way around that one. And uh, so, so th that's sort of the trick. And this is what happens on the square. If you wanna do the square, you have to cut two slits because the curvature here was equal to two and each slit removes one unit of curvature. When you cut the square open, you, get, you can write a 60 degree polygon that looks like this. And then you identify these things, they become the slits. And this hex mesh converts over to a, a mesh over here that has the optimal 72 bound. I did not have time to, to write the, the, the code to actually draw the mesh. Um, it's possible, I could probably do it in a couple of hours, but I, I'm afraid I didn't have time this week to, to do that. So that's the end of the third part. And this leaves me about 15 minutes or so to do the final part of the talk. Were there any questions though about that, that last thing before I go on to the, to the last part of what I wanted to say? You've been very quiet. It makes me kind of nervous. Like you've fallen asleep or gone away or, uh, or, or something. Uh, okay. We do have a question, but it's for sure. after the talk. It, it, okay, that would the, be fine. Yeah, that'd be great. So, so far I've been talking about taking a polygon and triangulating it, all right? Now I wanna talk about triangulating a PSLG. So here I've sort of drawn one, very simple one. It's a square and it has a edge going through it. And this has two faces, obviously. There's a face, uh, face over here and a second face over here. And one thing I could do to triangulate this is triangulate, triangulate each of the faces. Each face is a polygon and I know how to efficiently triangulate polygons. And, and so I can do that. If I do each face separately though, you notice, for example, here's a vertex for this side, but it's the middle of an edge on the other side. And similarly, here's a vertex for these triangles on this side, but it's the middle of an edge over here. So it's not a triangulation across the edges of the PSLG. So a conforming triangulation of a PSLG means that when you form the triangular edges, they actually agree and you have the simplex property across the edges of the PSLG. Now this turns out to be much harder to do than for a simple polygon. In some sense in a polygon, when you get to the boundary of the polygon, there's no triangle over here. You have to worry about matching up. Here, once you triangulate this side, you have to worry that you've added new vertices and that when you triangulate the other side, that it matches up. And when you're doing that, you're not adding another set of vertices, which has to be corrected on the, the first side again. How do you prevent that from happening? In general, here's, here's a PSLG, which is triangulated. If I add just one more point here, there has to be some edges coming out of that point. And those points say hit over here, but now those have to be, they generate some edges. And what happens is that adding even one point to a PSLG can generate a huge number of new edges that just sort of keep going on all the way around forever. And whereas polygons have order of N triangulations, there are some PSLGs that require N squared. You just can't avoid it. This propagation property, you can just prove, if I added, basically what happens is if I added um, N vertices here, if I made these triangles quite big and I added N vertices, each of these things would create paths of new, new things which don't intersect right away. Eventually they might come together, but basically it takes N steps for these things to come together. And if I start with N points, I generate N squared points that have to be in the triangulation. And so the complexity definitely goes up uh, when you're trying to triangulate a, a PSLG. Um, the history here is a little uh, briefer because there's not so many results known. If you're willing to give up the 90 degrees and just go with a larger bound, then that N squared lower bound is sharp. You could attain it. And a little bit later, that was 93 and 96. Uh, that was improved again with the, uh, the optimal bound. And again, if we go all the way back uh, to the 1960s, they proved that you can always attain 90 degrees but they don't give any kind of polynomial bound on that. It's sort of a, a geometry dependent bound. So either you can get the bound, but a badder angle, worse angle, or you can get the right angle you want, but without the bound. But uh, fortunately you can get the best of both worlds, okay? So something I proved a few years ago is that you can get a knot, you can get 90 degrees, 
with a polynomial bound, order of n to the 2.5, which is not as good as the known counterexample, so there's a gap. So here's an open problem for you, is to fill the gap. And I'm almost certain the right answer is n squared, because I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that the 2.5 is an artifact of the proof. Um, you can actually prove this with n cubed. It's quite a bit easier, but I, I didn't want n cubed uh, because n cubed already belonged to um, Edelsbrunner and Tan. They show that there's an algorithm of finding Delaunay triangulations, which was n cubed. And every knot is a Delaunay triangulation. So this knot theorem is producing Delaunay triangulations, but are even, they're a stronger version. It's Delaunay on, on steroids. You have this 90 degree bound. Okay, and so I, I wanted to beat uh, Herbert, and so I, I worked extra hard to get it below three, but I have not been able to get it below three. And I'll show you where the 2.5 comes from. It's a perfectly natural number in the proof, okay? Now, the basic idea is based on Gabriel edges, which are related to Delaunay edges. So if you have a point set, two points are connected by a Gabriel edge. If you take the disk with that diameter, and it doesn't contain any of the other vertices. Okay, so like this edge also doesn't contain any of the other vertices and this one also has it. But if you take a, a vertex like this and you take its diameter edge, well, here's something inside it, so that's not Gabriel. You may recall this is very similar to the notion of a Delaunay edge and the Delaunay edge, one of the equivalent characterizations is that each a Delaunay edge is the chord of a circle, which doesn't contain any other vertices. Here, if you took the diameter, if this was the diameter of a circle, the circle would look like this, it would contain that. So you can sometimes be the chord of a, of a disc not containing vertices, but not the diameter. And that's the difference between Delaunay and Gabriel. But since every Gabriel edge is a Delaunay, uh, we're gonna work only with, with Gabriel edges. Now, there's a black box, which I had, a, if I had a whole hour to talk about this, I would basically sketch the proof of this theorem. What it says is, it's enough to find Gabriel points on a PSLG. It says if you have a polydra, if you have a triangle and you add points here in such a way that when you draw these circles, they're Gabriel, they don't contain any of the other vertices, then there's a way of filling these in as a non obtuse triangulation using only the vertices you were given. And technically, and their midpoints. So you also use the midpoints and you don't add anything else. That completely localizes the problem because if you had another triangle over here and these were Gabriel, then you could triangulate this thing and this thing. And because you're using the same set of boundary vertices, they match up and you can triangulate the entire thing. So the plan for proving the theorem then is to take whatever PSLG you have, triangulate it by adding in extra edges, do it any way you want and eh, don't care. Just just triangulate it. Then you add extra vertices, if necessary, to get the Gabriel property. That's the hard part. And then you apply the lemma to triangulate each of these things, and all the triangles fit together to form a mesh. So the hard part is how do you do this, and how do you do that in polynomial time? Okay, so this is easy, and that's easy. The, the whole issue is adding these extra points. So the idea here, here's a triangulation, but it's not, doesn't have the Gabriel property because if you look at this line segment here and this disc goes around it, it obviously contains some points in here. So that's not a Gabriel, uh, uh, you're not a Gabriel points. Now, if you add these things and you look at these discs, you can check that each of these discs, in fact, doesn't contain any vertex points. And so given that, um, we know that we can triangulate using just these vertices in each triangle. And because we're not adding any new vertexes, vertices to this, we end up getting a, a non-obtuse triangulation of the entire PSLG, all right? So here's, the, here's how you do this. Take your favorite triangle, and we're gonna take the thick, thin decomposition. In this case, the thick, thin decomposition is pretty simple. Each name, each, each um, vertex has a neighborhood, which is the thin part. So this is what we were doing before. And the middle part is the thick part. Now, here I've drawn it so the thick part just has 
cusps on the boundary, it's actually nicer to thicken these up a little bit and draw a thick part that looks like this. So the thin parts are these and the thick part is in the middle. And you don't need a fancy conformal mapping program to find these. All you need to do is just choose um, these circles. What you want though, is if you take each of these edges and take these hemispheres, these semicircles, you want those to be disjoint. You don't want them to, uh, you don't want this thing to, to overlap this edge over here. So thick, but not too thick, okay? But this is, you can do by hand or do very quickly on a computer, no problem about this. Now, these points that you're forming are Gabriel points. Here I've drawn all the disks and you can see that none of these disks contain any of the vertices. So we have a Gabriel um, points for our triangle. The difficulty is when you add on a new triangle, like here's one. And now if you look at this edge, it's Gabriel circle is here. Um, it's containing one of the vertices of the adjacent triangle. That's a problem. Okay, so this circle is too big. We have to make it smaller in order to avoid that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this point and basically flow it across here. And then we're going to form these new disks, and this is going to be okay. And the way we do this flowing is we just observe that in the thin parts, each of the thin parts is foliated by circles, which are centered at the vertices. And we're just going to flow points across here. So if we have a whole triangulation um, like this, we form these thick and thin parts, okay? And so this is very fast to do. And then we choose a point and we're going to simply flow it along the foliation. So we take this point and we flow it along here and we do, every, do this for every point, we flow all these things. And what this does is generate a bunch of points. And these are the Gabriel points. These satisfy the Gabriel condition. Why is that obvious? Well, it's obvious because what you can think of is taking a little disc here. And when you have a sector and you have two circles of a given radius, a disc just naturally fits right between here. You can slide a disc between concentric circles like this. And so you can slide this disc all the way until either you leave the polygon or you bump into one of these thick parts. And when you bump into one of these thick parts, this disc is contained in this hemisphere this circle, and this circle by definition doesn't hit the opposite sides. We chose it that way. So these sliding disks provide evidence that when they cross the triangle edges, we obtain Gabriel disks and these points are great. So we found the points we want. Now we just have to limit how many there are. Here, for example, is a random triangulation of 10 points. Here are the central regions. I've drawn them just with the, the cusp points now because that was easier to program. And I propagate them and these are the points I get. And so all of these edges I, I generate will have the nice right property. And then that proves that if I use these vertices, I can triangulate everything and it all fits together into one big mesh and I'm happy. Here's an example with, with around 60 points. And when you flow the picture here, here are the central things. And you apply this picture, you get this picture. And now I'm starting to get a little bit nervous because these curves are you know, making a mess. In fact, if you do a, a, a simulation, what you'll see is that on average, these curves are not just starting here and going and ending, they're wrapping around and they're hitting about uh, on average end to the 1.5 triangles. That's numerical. It'd be great if you could prove that. I, I don't know how to do that. In fact, in some very special circumstances, if you set up the triangulation just right, you can arrange that these flow lines never terminate. They just go on forever and form this kind of fractal curve. That doesn't happen when you have these thick regions. So when you have these central regions that have some boundary, this is impossible. Um, but it can happen when you just have the cusp thick regions. So when you have the actual thickness, then you always terminate in a finite number, but maybe not a polynomial number of, of steps. So what we want to do is bring this down that it doesn't go forever, but it terminates in a finite number of steps. And the idea from continuous math is to use a closing lemma from dynamics. So the closing lemma says if you have a vector field on a surface, you can solve the vector field and you form the integral lines following the flow. And some of these lines can go on forever. They can you know, just do weird things. But if you have a line that comes back very close to itself, 
you can make a C1 perturbation so that it actually joins up and forms a closed loop. This is called the closing lemma from 1967. So this is a 50 year old theorem. Incidentally, this is known for C1 perturbations of the field, but the question of whether you can do this for C2 perturbations is still an open question 50 years later. So this is quite a delicate uh, thing. What we want to do is a discrete version of the closing lemma that we want to perturb the flows so that instead of winding around forever, they terminate after hitting about order of n triangles. And since we're starting with n triangles and each triangle has basically three starting points, if each of them only hits n triangles, we'll end up with n squared points and we'll have proven the theorem, okay? So now there's a few technical slides. What happens if you have one of these propagation lines keep hitting the same edge over and over again? Well, once a path hits at least three times, it's a topological fact that you can find a sub arc of it that has one of these three basic shapes. So it leaves the edge, it wanders around and it comes back, for example. This I call a G curve because it looks like a G. I can consider all the curves in this foliation that are parallel to this. And these form what's called a return region. So you basically are taking segments of your triangles and you're looking at collections of curves which leave that segment and come back to it at a later time. And you can prove that there's order of N of these return regions. And no matter where you are, any path anywhere eventually enters one of these after at most O of N steps. Now, if it's left to itself, it'll go through the region and exit and go somewhere else. And eventually it will enter another return region later on. But we don't want it. This is a, the classic Roach Motel. The paths check in, but they don't check out. And what we're gonna do here is as the path enters, we're gonna bend it ever so slightly so it hits the edge. And when it hits the edge, it stops. And so it doesn't leave. And so the idea is to bend the paths to terminate before they exit. And if this worked, because I only have to wait n steps for them to enter, and there's only n paths I have to count, before they exit, I will win with my order of n squared, which we know doesn't work because I said the theorem was 2.5. So something in this project, something here is going to break down. I'll show you what breaks down. What you also need is the Gabriel condition. So here I'm thinking of a return region, but I've straightened it out to look like a, a horizontal tube. And this is one of my propagation paths. It's um, going down here. So these are my triangles. You think of these lines, these are really edges of very, very narrow triangles, which are stacked up parallel to each other. Now, what I want to do is bend this path and make it come over here to the boundary. But if I bend it too quickly, it'll form a new vertex, which is inside this circle for this edge. And so that's not allowed. That's not a Gabriel edge. I have to bend it much more slightly. If I bend it carefully, then the new vertices I'm forming are outside these circles. And so these vertices are still Gabriel because they don't have those. And if we do this calculation very carefully, what comes up is that if this is the propagation line and these are the circles which are guaranteeing that these edges are Gabriel, I'm allowed to move the path, but can only move within this cusp, okay? If I bend it out here, if I, if I, if I try to bend this path way up here, I'm gonna generate points which violate the fact that the Gabriel disks can't contain any points. So to stay outside the disks, I have to be in this cusp. And so roughly what it means is if I go over distance delta x, I can only go up by delta x squared, roughly, divided by r, where r is the radii of these disks. We'll just assume r is equal to one. So instead of being able to bend inside a cone, I'm only allowed to bend inside a cusp, okay? And just to, to illustrate how this works, suppose that my return region was one wide and k long. So it's a one by k tube and it's cut up into n triangles, which I sort of drawn as rectangles here. And on each step, I can go up a little bit depending on these disks. And it turns out that the amount I can go up is k squared over n. And in order to make, in order to move this distance one half from the middle and make it hit up here, I need the length of this tube to be at least root n. I need to make basically, well, here's the arithmetic, okay? I need the tubes to be roughly one 
root n by one tubes. If I have a one by root n tube, then I can bend the path enough to bring it over and terminate it. Now, my tubes, it turns out, you can prove that their length is longer than their width. So as you go through them, the length of that curve is at least as big as the openings. That's not good. I need the length to be square root longer than the openings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add square root of n points here and cut this into parallel tubes. Now, each of these tubes is square root longer than it is wide. So when something enters here, I can bend it and it ends. And this works always. So of the n paths I originally created, I can terminate them all in n squared steps. Okay. The unfortunate thing is that when I cut the tubes into these channels, I created square root of n new vertices and these propagate and those have to be ended. And so there's actually a total of n to the 1.5 paths, which take n steps to terminate. And that's where the n 2.5 comes from. I think though that this is an artifact of the proof and with more work, we could uh, fix this up. So um, there are, I'm out of time now. So let me just say that there's lots of questions here. Uh, one of the main ones is, can you prove the n squared estimate instead of the 2.5, get rid of that gap? Um, can we get better estimates for dissections of PSLGs than for triangulations? For polygons, they turned out to have the same bounds, which was very, very shocking to me. But for PSLGs, I don't know that's the case. And finally, something that's really infuriating to me is that because knots are actually Delaunay triangulations, our order of 2.5 estimate for non-obtuse triangulation gives us a new algorithm for Delaunay triangulations. But Delaunay triangulations are more general or easier to build. But I don't know any faster way of building conforming Delaunay triangulations than I know of building the knots. Um, so again, this is kind of frustrating that um, using these IDs, but restricting to the more flexible case of Delaunay triangulations, we should get an even faster method. But I don't know how to do that. I, I, I'm sort of stumped. So let me just leave you with this thought from Shakespeare, who was also interested in, um, in the triangulations. And uh, thank you for listening. I apologize for running over a bit. I hope it, uh, it was uh, not too much of a problem. No, it's great. Thanks, Professor Bishop. Thank you very much. Uh, so for this very, very fantastic talk containing so much uh, interesting information and uh, beautiful graphs, uh, I think we have a little bit of time for, for questions. I, I see Nina has a question. Nina, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just have a, you know, I don't understand question, which is um, why when the path hits the boundary of the region, does it stop? That's kind of where huh. I lost it. Okay, so I'm being a little sloppy in my language. Um, so what we're doing here, remember, is we're trying to form, add points to the edges of the PSLG, which form a Gabriel system. That is when we form, take the, the, the complementary arcs that these disks do not contain any things. Mm -hmm. So these things are being propagated as a flow through the triangulation. Mm -hmm. If I have two paths, um, what will happen is that if I can bring two paths and join them together, that they will eventually, um, so, so, so eventually when I say that I'm, I'm joining a path, uh -huh. the new path uh, will either begin or end at one of these points, uh -huh. or it will end on the boundary. Uh -huh. And so by joining, I'm not really terminating them, I'm really sort of joining them in something else. But once I join them, I don't have to maintain a separate count for them anymore. So uh -huh. in some sense, that path ends and I'm just counting the things for the new path. Okay. And so, as I said, the, the, the more technical details are worked out. This is like a 50 or 60 or 70 page paper. So <laughs> okay. there's lots of details that I'm, I'm skipping over. But mm -hmm. this was the sort of the general idea. Um, one of the things I do want to mention is that we have these return regions. They these sort of things where paths have to enter these things. And these are, there's N of these scattered all over. Mm -hmm. But the estimate in the theorem basically goes that you have these N regions, but each of them involves N rect triangles, which is a total number. So every bad region contains every triangle in the triangulation is somehow involved in it. And in practice, you can never draw that. <laughs> you cannot draw something, a picture where you can draw 
pictures where the bad, where the return regions sort of have overlapping triangulations. They, they sort of, you know, use the same triangle more than once. But you can't draw it where there's n return regions, all of which use order of n triangles. So I think mm. there has to be some dividing up that some of the triangles can be in this region and some can be in that region. And maybe some triangles somehow split up half is in here and half is in here. And so instead of saying, so the worst case estimate I'm using is like assuming every triangle contributes something bad to every return region. Mm -hmm. But in real life, there should be some bookkeeping argument that says every triangle con contributes, you know, 50% badness to this region and 25% badness to that region and 10% badness to this, and it should add up. And so instead of getting the end to the 2.5 estimate, we'll get the end mm -hmm. of the squared estimate and squared. So I keep giving talks where I say that that's going to happen, but in 10 years or five <laughs> years or whatever, haven't gotten back to that. Um, I would give it to a student, but I am currently a, um, a professor in a department of pure mathematics. And um, I'm not sure, I feel a little leery about uh, having someone work on this. There's no one else in the department who does any kind of discrete mathematics. Of course, there's Joe Mitchell in the applied math department, but uh, I, I've been a little bit hesitant to, to give these problems to students. So. My wife would actually like me to uh, relocate somewhere. She's a little tired of Long Island. So maybe we could uh, fix that problem in the future. But, but this is definitely something where there's some room for improvement. And this general idea of this thing somehow being inspired by Pew's a closing lemma, the, the perturbations we're making are perturbations which have to lie between two tangent disks. So the perturbation curves are sort of trapped. You cannot make an, a cone angle. You cannot make a, an angle you cannot perturb the um, you cannot perturb the path by an actual angle. It has to be sort of a, a, a smooth thing. So this is very much like a C one perturbation. But if you have two disks here of different curvatures, you're allowed to follow one edge or the other. So the C two deformation could be discontinuous if if you think of these two curves, two bounding disks as being different curvatures. You say this method is allowing C one perturbations, but not C two perturbations. This is amazingly close to Pew's lemma. I mean, it is just the, the words, the English words okay. sound almost uh -huh. identical to his, but I don't know how to make a mathematical uh, identification between the two things. And so I think it would be really, really interesting to somehow find a meta theorem somehow that, 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 that somehow connected up uh, Pew's theorem on vector fields on surfaces to this more sort of computational complexity estimate. Of, of how quickly you can perturb things. So to me, that seems like um, really fascinating, but I, I, I'm kind of stuck. I, I don't know, know how to do it. So you're saying in these fields, you can have these sharp curvature discontinuities because you switch from one circle yes, to another. So, and so that's a lot looser than, than what Pew's theorem was dealing with. Right. Uh-huh, okay. So, so Pew basically, I was, you can perturb, so you have a vector field, which is a function. And um, Pew's theorem is trivial for C naught, where you just make continuous changes of the vector field. What you have to do is C1, where the vectors and the rate of change of the vectors is, is, is being perturbed in a C1 way. And for C2, it's open whether you can do that or not. Um, and somehow what we're doing, where we sort of allow, you know, we allow cusp type perturbations, but we don't allow angle perturbations, this is um, this is sort of to me it seems close, but I often often you notice coincidences, and sometimes they're just coincidences. But I'm wondering if this is not just a coincidence that there's some reason about this. Let me just mention um, if you do this whole proof, but in the perturbations instead of the cusps, you actually allow an epsilon degree of perturbation, so you don't have to stay underneath a cusp region, but you allow yourself an angle here what you can create is order of n squared over epsilon squared triangulations where the angle bound is 90 degrees plus epsilon. So if you don't care about actually getting the sharp estimate of 90, but you're happy with 91 degrees, then you can get the order of n squared estimate. So that 2.5 is coming from the difference between a perturbation of size epsilon and one which has to follow a circular tangent arc. And so, um, again, there's probably more we could say about that. Yeah, let, let's maybe uh, I don't want to hold the next talk, so one more. Know. I guess we can ask 
for one more question. I saw Maria had okay. a question. Yes. Yeah, let's. Okay, the, um, yes. yeah. I have just maybe a comment. Uh, it was a great talk with many beautiful results. So thank you so much. I appreciate your talk a lot. I just want to. Could you say who's speaking? I don't see the name. Maria, coming up. that's Maria Trunkova. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I just want to mention that uh, there is a result by Marina and Deverdiera. I think that you didn't mention that result. So it's kind of an opposite result to Burago and Zolgaler. So Burago and Zolgaler, they showed that they showed an algorithm that produces an acute triangulation, right? But they don't give uh, bounds, any bounds. No. So they can have very small bounds, uh, very small angles. Uh, there is an opposite result, which is a theoretical result that shows that there are best angles that you can achieve. So for spherical surface, it's between 51 and 64 degrees. And for hyperbolic surface, the best angles that you can get is uh, 54 and 72. But this is just theoretical results, so they don't yes. uh, provide an algorithm. So I just want to let you know, I, I'm not sure if you- yeah. I, I did know that result. In fact, I've been in communication with one of the authors in the last couple of weeks about, I have another theorem, which is not connected to this, but it has to do with uh, having a geodesic, it has to do with equilateral triangulations of Riemann surfaces, uh, and which um, Riemann surfaces can be equilaterally triangulated. There's a famous theorem of belly that says a compact surface has that property, if and only if it has what's called a belly function. And, um, and so Lhasa Rempa and I had recently proven that every non-compact surface has a belly function. So all non-compact surfaces have equilateral triangulations, which is a new result. And so this was obvious, this was related to the result you were mentioning. And so I was aware of that and, and we had done it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was very greedy today and talking about the things I was interested in and trying to cram in a bunch of it. If I was talking about any one of these theorems for a whole hour, then I probably would have been more generous to other people and uh, done the history a little bit more and so forth. But my goal today was, was twofold. But really the main goal was to, to sort of emphasize that I think there's a lot of, of, of interesting ideas that have been developed in, in analysis, you know, flows, dynamics, quasi-control mappings. And even though these are all continuous problems, somehow these intuitions might be helpful for discrete problems. And I've certainly found ideas I learned in the discrete world uh, to be helpful, even if it's not a case of just taking the limit of the discrete case to the continuous case, even just the basic ideas of, of you know, triangulation and complexity and, and how to do things. I, I found that very helpful in thinking about many of the continuous theorems I've thought about. I said, well, what if this manifold was actually a graph? <laughs> what if it was just a you know, set of vertices with edges and we're doing a random walk on it? What would happen? And from that, I was able to build up the intuition and then find a proof with Brownian motion or potential theory or, or, or something else. But the initial thought was, well, what would happen if I just had the integer lattice? I mean, what would the answer be in that case? And I've often found that, that even for things that at the end have no obvious connection to the discrete world at all, there's a discrete model, which is often easier to understand. And uh, so I'd like to just sort of encourage other people to, to think about these possible intersections. Also, I have a long list of problems I need help on. So, I also want to motivate people to read my papers and, and look at things and tell me how to solve problems I'm stuck stuck on. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think it's great to have uh, that very inspiring discussion. 